There is a hope and a light that shines as we journey through this life. We find His peace inside from the one true God who came to die. Good morning and welcome to On the Road with Jesus. My name is Rody Fisher, and I'll be your host today. Thank you for joining us, people, and thank you, Clint Gonzalez, for that wonderful lead-in song. And I do want to say that we are coming to you live from Hope Radio here in Corona, California. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the things that we have learned through your word. And Father, thank you for allowing us to have that word to go to daily, dipping in. Lord, I pray that you would be with us today, be with my special guest, Dr. Um, Jeff Cran, as well as his wife, Marlene, and <clears throat> Sean, as well as the uh, um, guy in the booth, and be with me as well. Father, we ask that you would um, guide our every move here. Give us wisdom as to what to say and do. Let this be your show and not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we are in Psalm 41 and another Psalm of David's. And I'm just going to dive right in because as I've, since I've got, since I've got Dr. Um, Jeff here. I know that we've gone long a couple of times. I'm going to have to cut mine really short. I'm going to try to read as fast as I can and get through it so we can get right in here. So Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding of your word. <clears throat> Let us hide this word in our heart, Lord. Be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed is he that considereth the poor, and the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make his bed in sickness. I said, Lord, be mercy, merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Yes, Lord. Mine enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? And if he come to see me, he speaketh vanity. His heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth, thee, he telleth it. All that hate, <clears throat> excuse me, all that hate me whisper together against me, against me do they dis devise my hurt. They, an evil disease say they cleaved fast upon him, and now he lieth, he shall rise up no more. Yea, my ear, I'm sorry, yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trust, which did eat of my bread, hath he lifted up his heel against me. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me and rise up, rise me up again, rise me up, and I may requite them. I'm hearing some background noise. I'm not sure what that is. By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemies, enemies do not triumph over me. And as for me, thou holdest me in might integrity, and and set us me before thy face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, I am welcoming my guests back again, um, Dr. Jeff Cran, and we've talked about his testimony before, and he is going to be speaking today on one of my favorite verses, I mean chapters, in Isaiah, and that's Isaiah 53. And welcome to On the Road with Jesus. 
It's good to be here again. Okay, super. So we're delving into Isaiah 53. Um, so I've got my Bible open here. Um, and let's just jump in. Okay. Uh, first thing is, you've read it. Your Jewish friends haven't. I have heard that because even the rabbis keep that away from them. I, I've heard from somebody that went to rabbinical school, and they've tried to ask to read that, and they, they go all over the place, but not there. So, I mean, that's that's a big deal right there, is right. that that you have access to a piece of scripture that, that is available to them, mm -hmm. but they've probably never been exposed to it. And that's why Chosen People did something called the Isaiah 53 campaign. I love that. Uh, because it was to get Jewish people to look at Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. And it is startling because Jewish people who don't have a reason not to start reading Isaiah 53, and they can tell you who they think it's about. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the story of a um, Jewish girl was in school, and this was in the day when you had release time and things of that nature. Release time. They still have release time. Okay. and uh, I'm, I still teach release time, actually. And uh, the Jewish parents came in totally angered mm -hmm. that you had my kid read about Jesus. And she said, well, you know, here, this is Isaiah 53 out of your, your scriptures. Read it and tell me who you think it's about. Mm -hmm. uh, and having read it, they immediately said, well, it's about Jesus. And the teacher's response was, this is in your book. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the cool things you can do with a Jewish person, um, if they've never read Isaiah 53, maybe they, they aren't listening to this show. I kind of hope they are. Yeah. But uh, maybe they're not, is to uh, ask them to read Isaiah, point out it's in their Bible, and ask them to tell you who it's about. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that I did before COVID was to have an Isaiah 53 table. Wow. Uh, with English and the Hebrew there. Now, where, where, where would you set this up? I set this up at First Fridays because First Fridays in Phoenix is an uh, art and craft sort of festival. It's open at night. It gets a lot of foot traffic. Uh, and you don't have to pay to have space. Uh, so I've alternated between doing tracks and starting conversations and having one of these tables. And what I would do is I'd say, you know, we're doing a little quiz here. Let's see if we get the same answers in Phoenix that we do in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, read this and tell me who you think it's about. Mm -hmm. um, and what I liked about that was uh, once someone's heard scripture, they can't unhear it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, OK, I didn't get to share anything with them. But they got shared with. Right. Because they were exposed to the word. Um, and so that's the thing you need to know, is that your Jewish friend needs to see this scripture because really it's part of what he was supposed to know. You would think, right? Except because you you know what it's about, I'm sure the rabbis know too. Well, there are two reasons given why it isn't part of the reading. Uh, Jewish people after Ezra. Ezra's credited, Okay. Uh, wanted to have a public reading of the scriptures. That was sort of commanded. Mm -hmm. And so they divided up the first five books into portions per week called Parsha. But along with those portions, there came a time when there was an emphasis, probably due to, to Rome and some other things. And so they have what's called the Haftorah, and that's a reading from the prophets. Mm-hmm. But I don't think most people have noticed that the section of your prophets and writings is far bigger than the five books of Moses. Yes. So when you try to break the, the five books of Moses into 52 weeks, which is what they do, and then you try to do correspondingly breaking the prophets down, you can't get everything doesn't, in. It doesn't fit. Yeah. It doesn't fit. So there used to be a three-year reading cycle, which became a one-year reading cycle. Hmm. And so uh, it's an interesting thing about our scripture, but God spends more time correcting Israel than he does giving them the rules because they didn't do so good at following them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's what you kind of end up with there. Now, it's true. Isaiah 53 is not read, and it's terribly convenient because then questions don't arise. Exactly. Uh, the question maybe why do you skip 53 and not skip 52 or 54? Mm -hmm. 
because you could lessen the amount of material by skipping before or after. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no real reason uh, not to skip before or after, mm -hmm. uh, except in terms of context. So you're reading Isaiah 53. Your friend starts reading. He says, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And he comes back to you and he says, now, wait a minute, Isaiah's writing this, right? And what do you say? Yeah, Isaiah's the penman. Well, it says, who has believed our report? So this must have happened prior to Isaiah's day, because that's past tense. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not what's going on here. Uh -uh. Okay. And there are two reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, you have to understand Hebrew doesn't have a present tense in the way English does. Uh, Hebrew has complete action and incomplete action. Uh, and so Isaiah is writing this, seeing it in his mind's eye or maybe in a vision. And he's seeing it as if it's happening. So when he's writing this, it, it seems present tense to him because he's writing about events that are so certain, so sure that they're going to happen. And he's writing about them as if they had happened. Okay. Now, we have a place like this in the Bible, uh, in Romans 8, where it says that those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. It's right at the end, right around Romans 28. Uh, and uh, you have a similar thing, language-wise. God is, is, is having Paul write that and due to the certainty of these things, they're written as if they have happened because as far as God is concerned, they're that certain. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's different titles for it. Uh, in Greek, we call it what's called the prolaptic aorist. That's a fancy term for a past tense that is functioning uh, in terms of some things that are future. We call this the prophetic perfect in Hebrew. And so Isaiah's writing something uh, as if it has happened because it is so certain to happen and because he is writing about its happening. And so that's why that's there. That's interesting. I've never heard it explained that way, but it makes sense. Yeah, you only have the perfect and imperfect in Hebrew. So it's like a light switch. It's either on or off. Mm-hmm. And so things are written in what's called a, a prophetic perfect. Uh, and so that's the first thing you need to know is this isn't Isaiah writing about something that had happened. It's Isaiah writing about something that's so certain to happen, it's as if it had happened. Okay. Uh, then your Jewish friend will say, well, this is all really interesting. But how do I know this is Messianic prophecy? I mean, there's nothing in the text. That says, ta-da, this mm -hmm. is Messianic prophecy. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dr. Michael Brown would get this sort of question. And he said, you know, most people don't understand how prophecy worked in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think people can relate to this now with the present difference, the new normal, mm -hmm. as we like to call it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it's being called. Mm -hmm. um, Israel most looked for a Messiah when they needed one. Mm -hmm. And that means that, that um, the Messianic hope was sometimes more upfront than it was other times. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that prophecy builds on prophecy. So it's like you're looking at a Polaroid. Okay. So when you're looking at prophecy, you're not looking at a list. I like to say God deals in story, not necessarily does he systematically give us a grocery list of truths? Right. And so as information is being added, Israel gets a clearer picture of Messiah with it being at its clearest right before he comes. Okay. Yeah. And someone might say, well, now, why doesn't God just make it really, really obvious? You know, God says, if you seek me with all of your heart, ever will you find me. Mm -hmm. uh, the seeking heart is the prepared heart. Mm -hmm. it, when you seek for the answer, you're already being prepared for the answer. Right. And so that's where that kind of, uh, that's where that is. And so God wanted them looking. 
And so he gives them limited information to keep the attention on this sort of thing, to keep the, the looking going. Um, and so when you turn to Isaiah 53, there isn't a red sign that says this is Messianic prophecy. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, how do we know it's Messianic prophecy? Well, one of the ways you knew that is it was about the Davidic king. It was about the coming one. The topic was Messiah. Mm -hmm. The other thing you knew is it was stuff that hadn't happened yet. Right. See, we, we call that which has happened history. Mm -hmm. We call that which is going to happen, divinely told to us by God, as prophecy. Mm -hmm. So if it isn't history and it's about the coming one, then it's prophecy. prophecy. Uh, and the prophets tended to write the big stuff down. We use a fancy term that Dr. Whitcomb used to love to use, a uh, uh, credible Bible teacher and a, uh, a creation apologist. Uh, and he used to say prophecy was epotelismatic. Now, people go, what does that mean? You got hills in California, right? Yes. I've noticed them. Yes. Looks a little bit like Arizona. Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Prettier here than Arizona. In places, yes. <clears throat> uh, but if you look at a mountain range, you see the tips of the mountains, but you know what you don't see between them is the valleys. Mm -hmm. That's epotelismatic. Oh, okay. The prophets looked to the next mountaintop, but they didn't explain everything in the valley. And so that's the way prophecy sort of works. So when we're dealing with Isaiah 53, uh, the first thing we need to understand is that um, the prophets are not writing a grocery list here. They're, uh, Isaiah's writing a certain uh, a description of Messiah with absolute certainty. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing you need to understand that is Isaiah 53 doesn't start in Isaiah 53. Okay, how far back do we have to go? You go two verses ahead. So Isaiah 53, the prophecy of Messiah, the suffering servant, runs from 52.13 clear to 53.12. I, I see that mine starts out with a heading that says the servant suffering foretold. Yes. Uh, and your English writer did you a favor. Mm -hmm. uh, what he did was he noticed where the divisions are in the Hebrew text. Uh, and I would say to somebody, one of the coolest exercises you can do is, is do sentence diagramming with Scripture. Diagram out the paragraph. Because when I'm reading through the paragraph, I get to this part and I see in 13, Behold. Mm -hmm. And that word tells me something's changed. Mm -hmm. There's something that's going to follow that I have to behold. I have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like the biblical ancient way of saying, listen up. Mm -hmm. And so that behold there changes things. Mm -hmm. And so Isaiah 53 starts with 52. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about some of the explanations that are given. Uh, I, I love this section of scripture because it explains why most Jewish people don't believe in Jesus. Well, he says, Why? And I'll say, well, because Isaiah 53 said they wouldn't. Because yeah. look at Isaiah 53, 1. Yeah. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, why does Isaiah have to ask who has believed the report if everyone's going to believe the report? Because there's many that's not going there's to. There's many. Yeah, you're right on. Uh, and so Isaiah 53 predicts that Israel as a whole is going to have trouble with this. Mm -hmm. Now, then we start saying, well, well, why does Israel have a hard time with this? What was their expectation about Messiah that they were expecting at the time Jesus comes on the scene? Mm -hmm. They were looking for a governmental Messiah, weren't they? And they were looking for a reigning king. We want the king. Mm -hmm. We want God's rule on earth, and we still do. Yeah. But what they were looking towards was the kingdom of God and the overthrow of the pagan empires that were oppressing them. Mm -hmm. uh, in Isaiah's case, it's preparing, it's related to Babylon. In the days when Jesus walked the earth, it was Rome. Boy, they'd had enough of Rome. Yeah. 
And so they are emphasizing the prophecies about the coming king and the prophecies about the suffering servant began to take a back seat. Mm. And so we tend to emphasize what we need or what we want, don't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they did likewise. And so when we get to this, um, and starting in uh, 12, I mean uh, 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. Mm -hmm. Now I have to understand the change here. You're going to see servant language here. Now, your Jewish friend, if he reads the previous chapters, going back to 40, is going to see that when this section begins, the servant is Israel. But when we get to 53, the servant is Messiah. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the sort of claim that some rabbis would make. They'd say, well, the the servant is uh, clearly Israel. I'll give you reasons why it's not, but I want to explain what's happening. We in America have a very individualized way of looking at things. The rugged individualist. Mm -hmm. In ancient world, a king was organically connected to his people. He represented them. Particularly in Israel's case, because Israel's king represented Israel before God to a certain extent. Okay. Okay. Um, And so... If we were putting this in terms, our president would be our representative head. If we were putting this in American terms. Mm -hmm. So when Isaiah starts out the servant Psalms, he starts out with the nation as a whole and moves to the one who will epitomize the nation. So it's moving from the collective group to the one who represents it and will fulfill its purpose. Okay. And so that's what's going on in the servant Psalms. And so if you don't pay attention to what's going on in Isaiah 53, it's very easy. uh, It's very easy to make the claim like this is about Israel. Okay. I'll let you know a little later that, that, that Jews in the Middle Ages, up through the Middle Ages, didn't accept that. That's, Hmm. that's actually a, a view that caught hole under Rashi. Prior to Rashi, the rabbis didn't agree with that sort of opinion. Uh, It was floated as a trial balloon once and didn't work out real well. Mm -hmm. And then centuries later, it's floated again. Okay. Uh, And so your Jewish friend will probably hear from his rabbi, well, it's about Israel. Because that's the standard commentary. When the rabbi goes back and he looks, he's going to look at what the sages have said. He's going to find Rashi. He's going to find that real convenient. And he's going to make the claim that it's about Israel. Uh, There are a lot of reasons it can't be. Uh, This particular verse of scripture is incredible in what it teaches us about God, what it teaches us about Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, It begins with the servant being prudent. Uh, The word prudent there means, uh, has the idea wise. My grandfather used to use it. Uh, He'd say seichel which is the word. And he'd say, you have to have seichel. You Mm -hmm. have to have understanding. You have to have wisdom. Uh, He will deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled. And what's interesting about the section of scripture is it starts with the servant's exaltation, Mm -hmm. moves to the servant's humiliation, then moves back to the servant's exaltation. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the servant being exalted and the kings of the earth being astonished. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first thing you might ask is, well, how astonished are they by Israel right now? And uh, I don't think Rome was terribly astonished by Israel. Uh, and I don't, I don't think the earth is all that astonished. Uh, but it moves, starts to move into his um, humiliation uh, with his visage being marred and he shall sprinkle many nations. One of the things we had to do in Hebrew class was to do a textual analysis of Isaiah 53. Mm. Each of us were given part of it to do. I think Professor Glazer threatened to have us actually published and create a collection of our work. Wow. I almost wish she had. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, that never happened. Mm. That was the great idea that chosen people had that they never did. Because the Feinberg students would have had something pretty neat to contribute 
Um, the word sprinkled there uh, is a word that uh, is considered what's called a textural variant. It means that some Bibles will translate it differently. It has to do with the vowel pointings in Hebrew. Sprinkled works. Sprinkled is sacrificial language. You sprinkled the altar with blood. Mm -hmm. uh, he will sprinkle uh, many nations. I don't have a problem with that. There's an alternative reading. Uh, kings will shut their mouths. It means he'll literally be have them speechless. They won't be able to say anything. They won't have a word to share. Mm -hmm. um, what had not been told them, they will see. This is something unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, what they had uh, not heard, they will consider. And that leads us into what's called 53 proper. Now you have the shock of the kings of the earth, and then you have the disbelief of the majority of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, when I've done this as a sermon, this is uh, when we get to the devotional thoughts. I've, you know, there's some great devotional thoughts that are important to the gospel uh, that really kind of help us with this. Um, but we have to understand that Messiah had to come at a time when Israel was not at her height. Because he'll, draw, he'll grow out of dry ground. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that plants that grow out of dry ground are growing out of bad conditions. Yes. So this isn't a time of Israel's height. It's a time of decline. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a good time for the nation. Um he will grow out of dry ground. There's no form or comeliness. There's no beauty that we should desire him. And I like to say it doesn't mean he was repulsive. It means he looked like the average Jewish person. There was nothing uh, in his appearance um, that would point to him being the Messiah. Nothing at all in his appearance. He did not walk around with a glowing halo around his head, as some medieval art would have. Uh, I, when I've done this in churches, I said, Jesus was not a chick magnet. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, he's the guy that you would see uh, going to a bagel place, and there'd be nothing particularly extraordinary about his appearance. Um, <coughs> yeah, and he would just... Um, just look like a normal guy. Um, he is not going to be well accepted in his day. Um, why didn't people like Jesus? He was not the sort of individual that they would have picked as a king. He's not that kind of individual. He's going to be an individual that is not going to look spectacular. Uh, he's not necessarily by virtue of the things that are the world standards, uh, necessarily going to be uh, that great in, in the outward things that people look at. Uh, he's spectacular in the way he deals with the leadership. Uh, he's incredible in other ways, but there's nothing... It, he's not a Hollywood type of guy. Um, and so he's not going to... Uh, be an individual that is going to enjoy um, the sorts of things that, that someone who looks real good. He's, he's a backwood preacher, so to speak, to borrow from our language, uh, who, though his content is spectacular, his wisdom is spectacular, the miracles are spectacular, uh, the appearance is not necessarily uh, going to be the draw. Um, his humiliation is obscurity first, suffering second. And so when we move to Isaiah 53, we move from obscurity to suffering. Um, and we move from four to six. Um, I remember a two hour long conversation with the yeshiva student who did not like uh, verse uh, six very much um, 
Now, when I talk about the Jerusalem road, which is a way of sharing the gospel from the Old Testament, I will go to Isaiah 53, 6. And his comment was, well, Isaiah is only talking about the nasty Jewish people. Okay, the no good nicks. Um, but what we end up seeing here is all we like sheep have gone astray. And the Hebrew word is kulanu. It means all of us. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity uh, of us all. So it can't just be the nasty people of Israel, because Isaiah is including himself. All. All, all, is, all. is all. All is all. And yeah. so that's why that's there. And I said to him, no, I'm sorry. you know." And I, in those days, didn't have the cell phone, but I carried a Hebrew text with me. So I opened it up to the Hebrew text and pointed to the word kulanu. Oh. I said, what's that word? All. You know that word. All of us. Uh, so Isaiah is including himself mm -hmm. in the section here. Um, there's a, a good deal of material. Um, why can't it be Israel? Well, all of us is Israel. Israel can't die for Israel's sins. It's true. Okay, because if you're dying for your own sins, you're suffering for your own evil. Mm -hmm. That's not redemptive. That's called cause and effect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like my kid stealing from the cookie jar and saying, well, uh, the fact that I fell and hurt myself and skinned my knee while I was stealing the cookies means that stealing the cookies was okay. That atoned for stealing the cookies. And I'd say, no, it didn't. I'd say you got spanked, but by hands other than mine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't atone for anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you okay. It doesn't cover your wrong. You're suffering the consequences of the wrong you've done. Um, yeah, the price still has to be paid. The price still <laughs> has to be paid. So it can't be Israel. <laughs> uh, one of my professors said that he... he knew from later on in the psalm, but it can't be Israel here. Mm -hmm. uh, the context doesn't allow it. Um, and uh, so you have an individual suffering who's the Messianic king. Okay. Uh, so how do Jewish people deal with that? How do they deal with a reigning king and a suffering servant? Now, what we have is the advantage of two comings. Right. Okay, we can reconcile that. But imagine you were reading this and you saw both descriptions, but you didn't know there were two comings. Yeah, so what do you do with that? Well, Jews began to try and float a solution. The solution was Messiah ben David and Messiah ben Joseph. Oh. This was called the two Messiah theory. You're still going to hear it in certain places. Um, and I'll reconcile it by making these two different pictures, two different messiahs. Mm -hmm. And so now I have a way to reconcile a reigning king and a suffering messiah. Mm -hmm. Now the answer is, if you have the same guy who has to fit two sets of criteria that are both mutually exclusive, then you better have him coming twice. Yes. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the logical solution. They tried another solution, which on the surface might seem logical. There's some reasons why I don't buy it. Uh, first of all, Messiah is always used in the singular. Mm -hmm. If Messiah is two persons, why is Messiahs never appear in my Bible? Messiahs. Messiahs. Mm -hmm. There is a place where two anointed ones are discussed in Zechariah, but that's not Messiah. Now, some rabbis might try to do that. They would go and say, well, the anointed ones in Zechariah are the messiahs, uh, there are real problems with that. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, the anointed ones are named later on in Zechariah. There's no indication that any, either of those two anointed ones uh, fit uh, both pictures. You don't have a, a picture of one of those anointed ones being messiah and, and fitting that. Um, so one of the things I point out is it's not plural. Two, Messiah has a genealogy. How many moms and dads can I biologically have? Mm -hmm. So if Messiah has a genealogy and there was a second Messiah, there'd have to be a second genealogy for Messiah. Right. And but there's, there's not. There's not. 
which indicates to me that God didn't want me looking for two different messiahs with two different lines. He wants me looking at one messiah with one line. Exactly. Uh, so that was one way of dealing with that. Hmm. Uh, not as popular today, but the popularity fluctuates. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that we're looking at there. Uh, Jewish people still have tremendous problem with reconciling the suffering servant with the reigning Messiah. Uh -huh. This is a sort of objection you'll hear all the time. Well, if Jesus was the Messiah, I didn't even get this from my dad, why isn't there peace on earth? Uh -huh. uh, why is there not God's kingdom on earth? Why is the law not going forth from Zion? Well, the answer is uh, wrong coming. Okay. It's a future coming. It's a future coming. Uh -huh. uh, and again, uh, I think this is great uh, because what God's doing is he's building up the kingdom citizenship before he brings the kingdom. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Uh, see, when, when men rule, they don't care if anyone wants them to be king. Right. They aren't after a loving relationship. They're after a forced government. Right. God's after a relational kingdom where his subjects willingly choose to worship and serve him mm -hmm. and he then willingly can bestow without any impediment the blessings of that kingdom upon his subjects mm -hmm. um, yeah that's good and so that's what we're kind of dealing with here um uh, the oppression goes on to the point of death I like to think of this as the Old Testament Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Okay. Where Paul says, let this mind be in you. You could turn there. Uh -huh. um, Philippians 9, is that what you said? Philippians, Philippians 2. 2, 9. Yeah. 2, 5 through, should be right around 5 through 11. Um, I have to get there. Um, I have to remember my New Testament books. Uh, by the way, a uh, little funny acronym, Gentiles eat pork chops. Yes. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, oh. Colossians. Oh, okay. It's the way I remember it. Uh, okay. It's just a funny. Um, Paul was steeped in the Old Testament. I, I don't care. There are a lot of, the most hated person in the Jewish community is probably the Apostle Paul. Jesus, okay, was a nice rabbi. Paul is sometimes treated as the inventor of the Christian faith. It's a ridiculous claim. But you'll get Jewish people who, who don't understand Paul at all. And they'll say, well, Paul came up with Christianity. Paul didn't come up with anything. Paul didn't die for my sins. Uh -huh. uh, Paul was responding to God revealing Messiah to him and all of his Jewish background then gets transformed and he looks through everything through a Messiah lens. And yeah. so in the back of his head are verses like Isaiah 53. I mean, these things are kicking back there. Uh -huh. um, and he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That means mindset, uh -huh. mental attitude who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Mm -hmm. Now what we have there, and then he goes on to say that Messiah will be exalted. Now that's, that's somewhat future. Mm -hmm. um, but what Isaiah 53 is, is almost a mirror passage. Mm -hmm. Messiah starts out... Uh, with a, a brief word of uh, exaltation in relation to the kings. Mm -hmm. Then you have his humbling, and then you have his exaltation again. Mm -hmm. So if someone said to me, well, Philippians is, is... is Copying? Well, they would almost say Philippians is some crazy idea Paul came up with, and I'd say, no, uh, Paul is saying nothing more than what... Paul is saying what Isaiah 53 sort of says. Mm -hmm. Um. And so uh, we have him being uh, literally to the point of death, but it's, it's, it's an innocent death. 
because no deceit was found in his mouth. He didn't lie. Mm-hmm. He dealt totally honestly. And who's pleased to go ahead and do all this? The Lord is pleased to grieve him, mm-hmm. which is which is also a little hard for Jewish people to take. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad used to say, you know, you're telling me that God killed his own son? I mean, I wouldn't even kill my own, you know. <laughs> you know. Did you remind him about the story of Abraham? Well, see, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a good place to go. Um, which is, again, you know, ties in. We've got this whole big story. Mm-hmm. Um, the big question often is, is who killed Jesus? Well, my sin killed Jesus. Uh-huh. Rome killed Jesus, uh-huh. in a sense. They were complicit. Israel was complicit, uh, but God himself also sacrificed Messiah. That's that's a little hard to take, but, but who planned this whole thing out? Uh, God. God. <clears throat> God and Jesus went willingly. And Jesus went willingly. And so you have this whole thing where God is pleased. Mm -hmm. Um, Jewish people often say, well, there's no evidence for a resurrection of Messiah. Well, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, to make his soul, verse 10, an offering. That's the word asham in Hebrew. It's used of burnt offerings. It's used of offerings that are totally used up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the interesting thing is, When you make his soul an offering for sin, he will see his seed and he will prolong his days. Mm -hmm. How does a dead guy prolong his days? Exactly. He Uh, comes back. He comes back. Uh, And so we do have resurrection here. Mm -hmm. We have a Messiah who has to die as an offering and yet has to see his seed and prolong his days. Mm Mm-hmm. in fact, in 12, he divides a portion with the great and spoil with the strong because he poured out his life so unto death. Those two twin themes. Mm-hmm. He's victorious, yet he's sacrificed. Mm-hmm. Well, the only way you can do that is having a resurrected king. Yeah. Uh, that's really what is absolutely necessary here. Um, don't be fooled by the word seed. By the way, I don't know if offspring is used in some Bibles. I think some will say it will he will prolong his offspring, oh. which is the same idea as seed. Um, uh, older English will probably use seed. And so some people will say, well, Jesus didn't have any children. Uh-huh. So this isn't about Jesus because he didn't have any children. Um, the word zara, seed, does not have to mean physical offspring. The Jews are seed of Abraham, but my dad's name is Herb. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. Seed doesn't have to mean offspring. One of the interesting places uh, this sort of idea appears is the sons of the prophets in Kings. But how many kids did the prophets have? doesn't mean the kids of the prophets. It means the school of the prophets. Mm-hmm. So the idea of seed can refer to those who are followers, spiritual uh um, descendants thereof, you know, spiritually seed. Mm-hmm. Like Paul calls Timothy his true son in the faith. And Paul isn't saying that he's Timothy's physical father in Timothy. He's referring to him as a spiritual son, as a... Uh, and so this word seed doesn't eliminate this being about Messiah, which is the claim that's sometimes made. Mm -hmm. Uh, seed there uh, carries that other connotation, the wider meaning of descendant, a spiritual descendant. Um, And so that's sometimes used to kind of poo-poo this, Mm -hmm. uh, but he will see his uh, seed. He will see his spiritual descendants, uh, which, by the way, that seed's still building to this day. Uh, anyone who hears this program and wants to accept Jesus becomes part of that seed. Mm-hmm. Uh, becomes part of that. He'll see his labor and be satisfied. And he will justify many. Uh, verse 11. Justify there is the idea of make righteous. 
Uh, we, we're familiar with that term justification by faith. Uh-huh. Uh, and so uh, Messiah's death uh, provides justification as far as sin, him being the offering. Uh-huh. Uh, is this about Messiah? Yeah. Um, and it really ends up telling us a good deal about Messiah who he is and what he's done. It also tells us a lot about God's ways. Uh, Before honor, there is humility. Uh, Before greatness, there is humbling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Messiah became exalted through humbling himself. And those who are his followers follow the same path. He who would be greatest among you must be servant of all. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, We follow the Messiah's pattern uh, before being uh, the way up is the way down. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the pattern for him becomes the pattern for his disciples. Uh, We don't have a real strong sense of that word. It was understood among the Greeks. It was understood among the Jews of Jesus's day. It's still understood today among the Hasidic. They have those who are their disciples, their learners. Uh, The best word is probably apprentice. So those who know Jesus are apprenticing under him. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that covers a great deal of the background there, and I tend to lose track of time. What I, oh, we've got about nine minutes, seven minutes. I did want to say that I looked up um seed um in verse 10 <clears throat> to see different translations and in some it says offspring other says descendants um some say seed um so you're right they do use different words to describe seed <clears throat> uh an id in hebrew sometimes will be by extension mhm um, and so this is uh, a word that has a range and can extend out to uh, non-physical representations. Uh, okay. The Talmud says that we're supposed to be sons of Aaron in being peacemakers, but it doesn't mean that Aaron, Moses' brother, is supposed to be our physical father. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's an extended use of the term for seed in the Hebrew. Okay, that's interesting. see that all all of them really are sticking to either seed descendants um, yeah offspring uh, the other thing just to know is that uh, the New Testament references Isaiah 53 uh, fairly extensively uh, I'm thinking uh, John 12:38. Isaiah 53 1 uh, Romans 10 16 uses it uh, now your Jewish friend might be like well that's a New Testament I like to say to my Jewish a Jewish person you know what you don't understand is that the writers of this New Testament were practicing Jews mm-hmm. uh, this is a Jewish book written by men very very understanding of the culture Uh, because uh, some Jewish rabbis will try to make out like this is some uh, New Testament, some horrible non-Jewish book that is uh, just a a horrible book. Mm -hmm. Uh, What they're ignoring is that that when you're talking about a Paul or you're talking about a Matthew, uh, you're talking about individuals that lived within the Jewish community, not outside of it. Right. So it's it's a writing. Um, The only author really that we deal with that we have a lot of questions about it you know was probably greek was luke Mm -hmm. um but i jokingly say he was a doctor so it's all right yeah 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 Uh, but he was definitely schooled um and and he he traveled with with paul so there was a lot of that that rubbed off but um he was just a very bright guy he also was given to want to research things out. 
Luke mm-hmm. is your historian. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's liable that he questioned. He asked questions. He wondered where things came from. Um, so the fact that the New Testament makes use of it, uh, the, the New Testament isn't misusing it. It's using it consistent with its its passage, mm-hmm. um, with its understanding. Uh, the other thing to pay attention to is that the first time this is translated, which is into Aramaic, which we call the Targums, they were read in the synagogue in Jesus' day. Mm-hmm. This is Messianic. The Targum says, my servant, Messiah. Oh. And so the Aramaic translation of this, which was read in the synagogue right around the time of Jesus, would have clearly stated it was Messiah. Okay. So it was clearly understood that way by the people of that time period. Interesting, because when they retranslated it from the Aramaic, they didn't use that term. Well, what happens is they didn't translate from the Aramaic. They went back to the the They went back to the Hebrew and went to Greek, and then from the Greek to Latin, and then from Latin to English. Okay. So really, by the time your Bible reaches English, uh, now, not always. I mean, the King James makes use of the Hebrew and the Greek. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So really, you're... Your Bible went from the Hebrew uh, to the to the Greek and English kind of separately. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> well, that clears a lot of it up for me. Do you want to wind it up for me in one sentence? Let's. Or? Yeah, let's wind it up. Uh-huh. Jesus is the suffering servant mm-hmm. who died for your sins. He will be exalted. And if you want to be a citizen of the kingdom, mm-hmm. you need to uh, go ahead and follow the directions that Rody's going to give in just a second. Oh, wow. Thank you for that lead-in. So if you're out there and you feel that, and I'm just going to say to you, today would be the day of salvation for you. Um, you've heard from the Old Testament that Jesus died for our sins. And I really want to thank... <clears throat> Dr. Cran for that because it made it quite clear to us that that this is Jesus dying for our sins and I love the fact it says here in 10 an offering for sin who else could be that that person so if you would like to say a short prayer and mean it with your heart and ask Jesus to come in and lead and guide you and make him your Lord and Savior today would be the day so follow me in this very simple prayer dear Lord thank you for dying on the cross for me forgive me of my sins past present and future of things that I may have done said or thought that are just not of you help me to turn from my past and walk with you on this new journey come into my heart my life i make you my savior for today and forevermore my redeemer my king my lord i ask this in jesus name amen thank you so much if you've said that prayer and meant it with your heart Please call us here at Hope Radio here in Corona, California, or write me on the road with Jesus. There's a area there that you can sign in and send me an email and let me know that you have accepted Jesus. You are a follower now of Yeshua. <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you to my um, my guest, Dr. <clears throat> Jeff Cran. And thank you for allowing us to dig deep into the Word. And thank you, Lord, for opening up the Word to us like this. I want to say goodbye to you guys that have joined us today, but please come back every any Tuesday or Wednesday here at Hope Radio from 11 to 12, Tuesday and Wednesday. God bless you. Contact us anytime. We love you. We'll see you next time. 
as we journey through.